You're good. Thanks to everyone who is just coming in right now. We'll give everybody a few minutes to get out of the waiting room and into our meeting and we'll start shortly. Thank you. Thanks to those of you who are joining us. I'm going to get everybody just another minute or two to get out of the waiting room and into our meeting, and we will start shortly. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for joining us this evening for the Doan Brook Restoration near Horseshoe Lake Park project. Um, this is our virtual public meeting to update everybody on what we have um, discovered during the pre-designed phase of this project. And then we will have a second follow-up meeting for this one. Um, so our next meeting will be an in-person open house where you can have an opportunity to come in, ask questions of the design team, see some of these renderings and these drawings up close, and then provide us with some additional comments there. Um, that meeting is Thursday, May 18th from 5.30 until 7.30 p.m. at the Cleveland Heights Public Library. And that will be the branch that is on Lee Road. As always, this meeting is being recorded, as are all of our other meetings. If you've missed the uh, past meetings, if you'd like to get caught up, please visit our main site landing page, which is neorsd.org slash Doanbrook. You will see tomorrow we will post this meeting, um, as well as there is an updated FAQ that is posted to that site as well, in addition to information about Thursday's meeting. So as usual, I'm here uh, to just give you a little bit of housekeeping information. My name is Jen Elteen. I am the Business Strategy Program Manager here at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, and I will be your host for this evening. So just a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Uh, we are scheduled to end this webinar at 730, but we will stick around if there are a lot of um, additional questions that keep coming through. So by no means will we uh, um, end it early if there are still a lot of questions. Um, as I mentioned, the recordings and the new frequently asked questions are available at NEO rsd.org slash Brook. Now for probably the most important thing for you to know today um, is if you have questions for the design team, please post them using the Q&A feature here within Zoom. It should be located at the bottom of your screen in most, in most setups. Um, you can ask your questions there. Um, I will work to answer them and I will post answers um, for you on the answer page. Um, and then, but some of the questions, if it's a little bit more complicated, if it involves a little bit of additional explanation, I will hold those towards the end. And I will have someone from the design team, whether it's a sewer district staffer or someone from um, the design team um, answer those questions for you. Um, but please make sure it's a question um, because I can't respond as well to comments as I can a question. So um, if you can do that for me, that would be great. For those of you who are maybe watching this as a recording and you're not here live with us to use the Q&A feature, please note that you can send all emails to ask us at neorsd.org. All emails that are sent to that email address, they are logged by our customer service department and they have a great tool that lets us route those to the right person here at the district. Um, if you don't feel comfortable using the Q&A feature and you do have a question this evening, we are also monitoring that inbox this evening. So if you don't wanna use the Q&A function, you can by all means um, send us an email. Um, again, that's ask us at neo rsd.org. So just to introduce a few of the district faces um, that you'll see, you might see here today, um, we have Frank Greenland, who is our Director of Watershed Programs, Matt Sharver, our Deputy Director of Watershed Programs, Dennis Aharia is the Project Manager who is running this project, 
and we had Janet Popielski, who I will pass the mic over to very shortly. She's our stormwater program manager. Um, some of you, we do have um, a new, a newer uh, person on the team, not new to the district, but new to the specific project team, and it's Cisco Rivera. Um, you will see him out at a lot of our community events, working. Um, in the area. He is our watershed team leader. So he acts as a liaison um, with the cities of Cleveland Heights, Shaker Heights, and a lot of our other east side communities. Um, lastly, I would like to invite everybody here to attend our Clean Water Fest um, on September 23rd. More information about this amazing event is at cleanwaterfest.com. And once again, if you haven't had a chance to jot it down yet, you can send any emails um, today or during the recording to ask us at neorsd.org. And with that, I will pass uh, the platform over to Janet Popielski, our stormwater program manager. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us for our third public forum for the Dome Brook Restoration near Horseshoe Lake Park project. In just a moment, you're going to be hearing from the team who's been working for nearly a year now on the preliminary design for this project. Back in December, we presented three different stream alignments for the restored section of, of Dome Brook through this area. Tonight, they're going to be presenting to you the preferred stream alignment, as well as the landscape integration plan that took all the information that you've been providing over the last several months to incorporate it into the surrounding land as we restore Dome Brook. We have a lot of material to cover, so I'm actually gonna turn it right over to Matt Langan from Stimson Landscape Architects. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Janet said, my name's Matt Langan. I'm a landscape architect at Stimson and I'm the project manager for our design team that's been hired by the district to execute this project. Uh, I'm going to walk you through tonight uh, a little bit of what we've been up to for the past few months since we were last in front of you to give you a sense of where we've landed with a vision for this great project. Uh, and to do that, I wanna make sure that we start by summarizing what we're calling the pre-design phase. The pre-design phase is a planning phase of work that we've been uh, part of over the past year. Uh, and within that pre-design phase, we've identified three specific tasks that we've been executing. Uh, the first task is a discovery task. And if you were with us at our first virtual meeting back in October and November of last year, you saw, I'm sorry, back in August and September of last year, you saw a lot of the discovery components of the project. Uh, it's really our understanding of the existing condition. We then shifted to an alternatives development phase where we studied a series of alternatives that we'll summarize here for you tonight as well. And then we've just, we're just wrapping up our integration and refinement phase where we've made a recommendation for stream alignment and we've integrated all of the feedback that we've heard from our great engagement process into that landscape integration plan, which is really what we're gonna focus on tonight. And then again, as Jen mentioned, we will have a moderated question and answer period at the end of the presentation this evening. And so again, just to summarize where we are, uh, if you look on the top of your screen here, you can see the pre-design phase is the first of many design phases between you know, planning and construction. And we are very clearly still in the planning stages where we're gathering all of the information, all of the feedback that we're gonna use to develop the design further in the detailed design phase, which will be kicking off this fall. And then if you look down at the bottom of the screen, you can see how we've separated that pre-design phase into essentially three equal parts, the discovery task, the alternatives development task, and then the integration and refinement task. And we're here to show you how we've been integrating all of your feedback and refining a plan that we think will serve as a great vision to push forward into the detailed design, excuse me, detailed design phase, which will be starting this fall. And so before we dive into the details, I wanted to zoom out first and show you uh, what we think a vision for this landscape integration plan looks like. And so here we are hovering over the park, looking back towards downtown Cleveland and Lake Erie and beyond. And we thought that this was an important place to start because we wanna make sure that uh, there's an awareness that we are operating, we are working for the um, regional sewer district and all the decisions that we're making during this pre-design phase 
are ensuring that we're meeting the regional stormwater management program goals that have been set by the district. And so we don't want to lose sight of the fact that we're working in a broader region. We're working in the Donebrook watershed, which is much bigger than our project area. Uh, and we want to make sure that every decision that we make, every design decision that we make, we understand the impacts of it uh, elsewhere within the watershed and within the region. And so for this particular project, we want to make sure that we are eliminating those ODNR dam safety regulatory requirements of a high hazard dam. And by eliminating the dam itself, we are eliminating the risk and maintenance of that high hazard dam. We also want to make sure, as you all know by now, that there's quite a bit of sediment that's built up behind the dam. And so this uh, rendering that you see here is our first step at establishing a vision for moving all that sediment out of the way and creating a really great 21st century park space that will uh, allow, enable us to, to make that stream restoration project um, go through. And as part of our goals that we set for this pre-design phase and for the project as a whole, we wanted to make sure that we're developing a comprehensive landscape plan that incorporates all of the ecological, cultural, and recreational amenities that we've talked about during our engagement process. And we challenged ourselves and we challenged you to think of our study area, not as a six acre peninsula park, uh, but as a 60 acre park. And we think that um, shifting our attitude towards a much more 21st century version of what a park might be uh, and, and the, you know, the ecological and, and uh, hydrological importance of an urban watershed might be something that we want to feature here in the park. Of course, you know, as part of our mandate being hired um, to do this project, we have to make sure that we're restoring those stream corridors through our 60 acre parcel. We want to make sure that we're managing all of that waterway sediment and putting it in places in a, that's cost effective so that we can stretch our dollars as far as we can. And then, of course, we have to remove the dam to mitigate all of that risk um, before, during and after the construction of the project. And so we had a long conversation about these goals and objectives, and we presented a lot of that content to you back in August of last year. And just as a, another reminder, um, that virtual meeting that we presented is, is available on the district's website at nersd.org forward slash Doan Brook. So take a look at that if you've missed it or want a refresher. I will give you a very quick refresher of that meeting right now over these next couple of slides. So this first discovery task was all about hearing from you, hearing from you about what you think is appropriate uh, to consider for this park space as we expand the footprint of the park to cover the whole 60 acres. Um, we asked a lot of questions. Um, we asked you to sit down and draw with us. And then we asked you to respond to imagery of what the character of this park might look like. And we've tabulated and, and recorded all of that information. We brought it back to the drawing board and we've used this to help guide our design process. We also hosted a whole series of walks and pop-up events where we were able to get and meet with you one-on-one -on -one and, and ask questions and, and be able to show you what the existing conditions really are on the site, what a, a recently restored stream looks like down in University Circle, and what are your other thoughts about what we should um, be considering as we're starting to design the park? And then we shifted into an alternatives development phase. But during that shift between the discovery phase and the alternatives development phase, we sent out a survey. And, and um, we were really thrilled at how, um, how many people responded to the survey. And we got a lot of really great data. And so we asked a whole series of questions about what you'd like the landscape to look like. What are you most drawn to in the existing park? Um, what, are, what is the quality or the character of the materials that we would use to construct new park amenities? And so we've tabulated all of that information and we presented some of this back to you back in November uh, and December when we had our virtual meeting number two. And again, as a reminder, that's all recorded and available on the district's website. This was critically helpful for us because it's really, you know, we have a design team that comes from all over the country, uh, but we want to make sure that when we're working in your backyard, that the character of the spaces that we design are, are really uh, look in the look and feel that you're most familiar with and the most appropriate look and feel for Northeast Ohio. 
we took all that information and then we created four distinctly different alternatives to think about and to study. We developed a middle confluence scheme where we put the confluence of the north and middle branches of Dome Brook right in the middle of the old dam as an alternative. We looked at an upper confluence scheme where we pushed the confluence of those two streams further to the east towards Park Drive in the Park Peninsula. And then we looked at lower confluence schemes. There was two versions of this. The alignment of the stream was the same, but the way that we managed the sediment around that stream changed between lower confluence A and lower confluence B. And ultimately we did uh, a whole series of studies on those alternatives and we concluded that um, we thought it was most appropriate to move forward with what we're calling the upper confluence scheme that you can see here highlighted as uh, an engineering diagram. And there's a lot of reasons why we re made this recommendation to the district and to the cities that this is the most appropriate stream pr profile and alignment to proceed with. And long story short is that it's just because it performs the best. And I'll walk you through some examples of um, how we came to that conclusion. Um, but this is the, the stream alignment that ultimately you'll see all of our landscape integration planning work in the next couple of slides focused on. So for those four alternatives, we did a series of engineering studies and, and this took a lot of work, which is why you haven't heard from us in a couple of months, because we had to build very detailed um, 3D models, virtual models, where we ran simulations through those models to understand how the hydrology was gonna work. And so here on the screen, you can see on the left-hand side is a model of the upper confluence scheme showing the average stream and floodplain velocity. That's essentially the speed of the water as it's passing through from the north and middle branches through our site down to the Lee Road culvert and beyond. And you can see that the average stream and floodplain velocity for the upper confluence scheme was 3.95 feet per second, which performed the best out of the four alternatives that, we've, uh, that we had developed and studied. On the right-hand side, um, you can see the average stream and floodplain shear stresses at 1.15 pounds per square foot. That's basically the amount of pressure that the water is putting on the substrate below you know, the ground. Uh, in, its, in its desire to pull that along with the stream. And so we want to make sure that those shear stresses are as low as possible. And this performed really well in our engineering studies of that as well. And then we also looked at the floodplain and how much space we can give the, the two branches of Doan Brook to uh, ex come out of its stream banks and access this floodplain to slow the water down, store the water and fil filter the water before ultimately it made, makes its way back into the stream channel and downstream out to Lake Erie. And so on the upper left-hand side, you can see a six month storm event. And that six month storm event uh, activated about 13 and a half acres of the floodplain. Um, on the top right-hand side, you can see a two year storm event and that activates about 17 and a half acres of floodplain. And then on the bottom, you can see the 100 year storm event, which activates nearly 22 acres of active floodplain. And we'll explain a little bit more about what exactly that means. But um, the colors that you see on the screen are essentially the blue is zero to two feet of depth. So that's how deep the water would be after one of these storm events. And then the yellow areas and the orange areas um, are areas that are anywhere from two to six or eight feet deep. And they're very limited to the areas where we want that water to be deep. Uh, and we'll show you why we want that in a few minutes. As part of our analysis of the alternatives, we also identified a series of ecological uplift strategies, ways that we can improve the overall function and ecology of the study area as part of our project. And so here on the upper left-hand side of the screen, you can see the extent of preservation of mature trees that we've identified the upper confluence scheme to achieve about 30 acres of preservation of those existing trees, which are really great performers, you know, certainly ecologically and environmentally for us. And so we wanna minimize the impact to that tree canopy. On the upper right, you can see new natural areas at, a, at about 18 acres. This is effectively the area where we have to do the major construction operations, moving that sediment around to create the new stream corridors. 
And then on the bottom of the screen, you can see what we're calling floodplain wetlands and seasonally inundated areas. And these are places that are going to function as stormwater filters for us. Um, and, and that's going to be roughly 19 and a half acres total. And so with that, we've developed a vision, which we're calling our landscape integration plan. And I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Glenn Valentine at Stimson to walk you through some of the highlights of this plan before we dive into some of the other systems that we've built up to, to get to this point. Thanks, Matt. Um, just wanna start off by saying um, how excited we are to be here with all of you and to share with you this preliminary um, draft landscape integration plan and, and show you some of the features that we've developed with the in, all the input that we received in all our community outreach and talking to you and walking through the various sites. It's been a great process. This is the, um, the draft plan. And it's essentially, the, the, the park plan itself is essentially a dynamic floodplain where we've used the sediments of the former lake bed to construct overlooks along the edge to get better views into the park and a series of constructed wetlands throughout this restored stream corridor. The resulting park results uh, creates increased health for Doan Brook, um, ecological uplift for all the different landscapes that we're developing along the, the edges of the stream and within the stream itself and highlights the unique cultural and, eco and environmental cultural and historical legacies of this area and um, really of the whole Donebrook corridor. So we're excited about all of those results and the process. And Matt's gonna go through all of the major systems of the park, but we thought it was good to just start off with an overview of some of the major features of the park before we uh, dive into more detail. The first thing we want to talk about is sediment and sediment management. That's been one of our major, major tasks here. And we've used the sediment, as I mentioned, to create landforms. And maybe, Matt, if you can help me point some of these out, there's these um, series of promontories or overlooks along the south side of the park. It's this kind of undulating wave. Each one of these is a, a kind of point that sticks out from the side. Uh, the edges of the park to give you a view down into um, the restored stream valley. And at the bottom of these, we've created a series of stepped or terraced wetlands, these kind of crescent shaped um, water areas you see at the bottom of these overlooks on both the south side and on the north side as well, and throughout the park really, that will help cleanse the stormwater from adjacent outfalls and um, provide really diverse and unique habitats along the length of uh, the restored stream. So that's the, these, these landforms have helped us create a series of distinctive ecological zones, starting with the, the floodplain itself, which will be restored with native plants. And then you'll have these stepped wetlands that I just mentioned. And then above that, we're envisioning these sloped hillside meadows, this kind of yellow zone that runs along the south and the north side of the uh, new park space that'll be all native wildflowers and grasses. And then above that, the restored forests um, and the restored parkland um, along the edges as well. The next major component is the circulation system. And we've created basically a one major spine from east to west running or west to east, running through the center of the park, taking advantage of the historic parkway crossing at that point and running along the stream valley and connecting all of these new features, these created wetlands, terrace wetlands, providing access for pedestrians and for bikes and providing um, a way to maintain and get access to all of these new features. Uh, these these path and also there's a series of um, uh, circulation routes running north to south that connect both the two communities to each other and the communities to the new wetlands and um, um, restored stream corridor. And they are the the pathway across the former dam, which is going to be connected with a a new bridge in the center. On the far west side, there's there's also a more um, circuitous path that, that runs down into the restored stream valley over a boardwalk and then out to Lee Road. 
And then moving to the east, there's a new uh, curving serpentine kind of um, trail that runs from the Shelburne at the north, slides down this promontory down to the re restored stream corridor along the base of the Horseshoe Lake Park itself, and then across the South Branch and then back up to the connection at Attleboro and South Park Boulevard. And all of these, these circulation systems are built on landforms that also help us contain and control these waters. And they're really what allow us to create these diverse ecologies and environments um, these, these steppe wetlands that I'm talking about, they're, they're correlated and, and they work hand in hand with these, with these new circulation systems that we're designing. Uh, we've also placed the amenities that we work with all of you to um, prioritize and situate in our workshop throughout the park. And we've placed them as, as evenly as we can so that people will enc encounter them quickly when they come to the park and really have uh, the experience of one of these amenities almost wherever you come into the park. I'll just highlight a couple of them here, some of the most popular ones that we found from the exercise. One was uh, Nature Play, which we've located down here at the nose of Horseshoe Lake Park, and we're envisioning as kind of an interactive wetland play area. And the hillside amphitheater, hillside seating to the south was a, was a major feature that everyone loved, and we, we've put this here in this um, in this draft plan. Um, another one was the, um, the um, canopy walk, which we put over in the western half of the site where there are the highest trees and the best access to the most uh, mature specimens on the site. And finally, we've begun to develop the actual plant communities that we would have in the park in each one of these spaces. And we'll get into that as we get into more detail of the plan. But Hopefully that gives you a sense of the main features that we've been developing and of the overall uh, plan um, that we're, we're gonna be walking through in more detail now. Great, thank you, Glenn. So what I'm gonna do now is, is walk through all of the systems like Glenn mentioned that we've thought of to help get us to that vision that Glenn just summarized for you. And then we're gonna look at that uh, plan again and zoom in and talk a little bit more about the specific things that we heard from you that we've designed into the park in this in the areas strategically that we think are most appropriate for those types of amenities so just starting with earthwork we had the strategy based on our observations of the site of these existing promontories and these promontories are essentially um areas of high ground that kind of push out into the floodplain today. So clearly one of the biggest ones, and this one is not natural, is the old earthen embankment. But there's many versions of naturalized uh, promontories that stick out into the floodplain. And these were created by the stream meanders of the historical stream locations. And we find that when you're walking through the woods, especially on the lower half of the site, these are really magical places where you get prospect up and over the understory of the forest and, and really get these great long views. And we want to take advantage of that as a strategy for designing um, our park within the context of this existing condition. And so to do that, our first step was to take out the um, piece of the earthen embankment where we want that stream alignment to pass through. Uh, in the place that we know it's going to function the best hydrologically. So we want to cut all that inform, or all that um, soil out of the earthen embankment and use it to create stronger promontories on the south side and the north side. And this is strategic for a couple of reasons, but we want to make sure that um, we're providing access vertically from the surrounding boulevards down into the stream valley. And so to do that, we have to have these long meandering walkways, as Glenn pointed out. And these promontories will be the vehicle to allow us to get up and down into the floodplain. The second major step from, a, from an earthwork perspective is to create these embankments. So this lighter green here that you can see, these are embankments or, or berms effectively that we're creating out of the material that we're taking out of the earthen embankment. And we wanna put these in place in strategic locations that will allow future circulation, future pathways, but also 
we want to make sure that we're containing the sediment that has built up behind the, the dam. Uh, and we don't really want that to be subject to a lot of storm events or a lot of structural uses for park activities or amenities. And so we want to put that sediment behind these berms that we're creating. And so that's the lightest green here. You can see where we're using those berms to create tubs where we're putting the sediment behind it out of the way of the stream. And we're also going to use um, the sediment to fill in the old stream alignment downstream of the dam, which I'm highlighting here because that uh, it's a long story, but that uh, stream channel has a lot of issues that we want to resolve by actually relocating it further to the north. And we'll talk through some of those as we go through some more diagrams here. The earthwork strategy has a direct relationship to the landscape ecology. And so what you're seeing here is the existing landscape ecology, which as you all know, if you're active users of the park is really fraught with a lot of invasive species coming in, especially in the impoundment area where the, the lake used to be. And so that invasive floodplain is exactly where we want to do all of our manipulating of the sediment to make that move that material out of the way and put more highly functioning um, plant material that's native to the area and has an ecological function back in the place of this. Uh, we also know that in this hatched area here are um, mature um, forested areas of the Doan Brook, both on the middle branch and the north branch, and even downstream by Lee Road. But there is a ground cover and an understory layer of invasives that we want to remove uh, while still protecting that important tree canopy. So that's all part of the project and, and things that we have to consider. But as we're doing all of that earthwork, uh, we have to really rethink the proposed landscape ecology because it's going to shift pretty drastically. So this is a diagram of the proposed landscape ecology. And Glenn started to allude to this a little bit as he was presenting the plan, but we've broken this out into a series of uh, diverse landscape typologies. The, the lowest one, or vertically, the, the one that's closest to the bottom is this pink area here. And this is the restored native floodplain. This is where the water is going to be flowing through the corridor and down towards Lake Erie uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly, and annual basis. And so this is the area that's going to be um, most impacted by storm events of all sizes. As you start to step up in elevation back towards the boulevards, there's a series of different plant communities that start to um, take place. This bluish area here, this aqua color, is what we're calling the constructed wetland plant community. And this has a, a different function than the stream corridor. Uh, and it's a little higher and protected from um, those storm events. And then as you come uphill even further, you encounter this native meadow or hillside community highlighted here. And this is really negotiating that major vertical grade change from the lowland wet areas to the upland dry areas. And then when you get to the top, you'll have a series of man managed lawn spaces, like you have at the Village Garden Club's uh, grove of trees here on the uh, Long South Park Boulevard. And then you'll have forested or matured tree canopy areas like you have downstream here on both sides of uh, both North, South and Park South Park Drive. And as we shift to circulation, it's important for us to make sure that we're providing access, equitable access to all of those different ecologies that are going to be designed into the park space because we want the park experience to be accessible to all. And part of the um, interpretation and uh, education of what an urban stream corridor should look and feel like. And so the circulation is going to help us get there. And the first thing to note here is that we want to take advantage of the existing circulation infrastructure that's in place. So the existing sidewalk along North Park Drive, or I'm sorry, North Park Boulevard, we want to make sure that we're utilizing that. And the bike lanes along North Park Boulevard, we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the fact that there have been investments in bicycle infrastructure uh, adjacent to our study area. On the south side, we want to make sure we're taking advantage of the bike share -o lanes that have been installed in South Park Boulevard. And we want to make sure we're using the existing asphalt path that brings you from Park Drive uh, over towards uh, the, the old earthen embankment. We also know we have to repair some of the problems that have been created by the, the failure of the dam. 
this area here is the existing emergency breach that was cut into the the dam and has severed the circulation across the dam. We we need we know we need to fix that, and we also need to install a new bridge across where the stream is going to pass under on its way downstream. And then we have to start building new infrastructure to make sure we're providing access to all of these park places. The first one and the biggest one that you can see here highlighted on the screen that Glenn mentioned is the shared use path that's going to cut all the way diagonally through this project area. And then once it gets down to South Park Boulevard, it's going to loop around so that you have access into the Park Peninsula without having to walk on Park Drive itself, whether you're coming from Shelburne or from South Park Boulevard. We also want to make sure that we heard loud and clear that an accessible path that continues from that earthen embankment all the way down to Lee Road is something that we definitely need to include in this project. So we've shown that accessible path as being uh, added to the existing circulation system. And then as we look more and more at additional circulation, Glenn highlighted for you a couple of the north-south paths. This one highlighted here as number one is a, a more circuitous connection from Lee Road up to North Park Boulevard uh, and across the street to the Beaumont School. There's also a, a kind of a sweeping walkway that brings you down into the stream valley and back up the other side connecting Shelburne and South Park Boulevard, which is critically important because that's um, where, where we've seen and heard a lot of uh, park users are coming from those two intersections. And we wanna make sure that there's ease of access across the site and to all the amenities that you'll see in a few minutes. And then thirdly, uh, a, another bridge that stays high uh, at Attleboro Road and connects you from the Park Peninsula down to South Park Boulevard in Attleboro where there's public transit accessible uh, on the uh, Shaker Boulevard, just, just below this image here. And then lastly, I'll just point out, and it's too much detail to get into tonight, but a whole series of secondary and tertiary pathways highlighted in this aqua color that will preserve a lot of the primitive trails that we know a, a lot of you really love to use along the edges of the park and introduce new accessible and other primitive trails uh, here and there to make sure that we're providing a, a variety of uh, path typologies and different experiences in the park. And the circulation, when you layer that with the ecology, is really what has created this framework that we're um, very, being very um, deliberate about because it's controlling the hydrology. And so here you can see a series of diagrams, which I'll go through in just a minute here, that highlight different storm events. And I want to highlight for you what's happening when those storm events are happening. So this is just a very typical small rain event. You know, you it rains for, you know, an hour or two on a, on a Saturday morning. And what you're going to see is that the stream will fill up and, and it'll be delivering water from the middle branch and the north branch into the confluence point and continue on. You'll also see a series of these wetlands along the edges starting to get hydrated. And there you can see they're not physically connected to the stream. So the water's coming from a different source. The water's actually coming from a series of existing stormwater outfalls that right now just dump water directly into Doan Brook. What we're doing in this plan is we're intercepting that and allowing that water from the adjacent communities to be filtered through a series of these terraced wetlands uh, and, and allowing us to cleanse that water as much as we can before we deliver it back into the brook in multiple locations. So that happens here on the south side, and it also happens here on the north side. There's an, another existing outfall that comes out from Shelburne, another outfall that comes from near the Beaumont School, another outfall uh, again that comes near the, the Beaumont School, and then uh, uh, another outfall that comes from the south, from South Park Boulevard towards this direction here. So we're intercepting that water into these wetlands and filtering in that and slowing the water down before it gets to the brook. And as I build up these next couple of diagrams, you'll see bigger storm events. So here's a six month storm event. And what that means is it's about an inch and a half to an inch and three quarters of water in a 24 hour period. So this is, you know, a, a pretty normal storm event that you would have uh, in, uh, in Northeast Ohio. And what you can see happening here is the streams 
both the middle branch and the north branch have come out out of its banks and have activated what we're calling the active floodplain. This is about an 80 to 100 foot wide strip of land that runs continuously uh, along the stream corridor. And we want this to happen. This is important because we want that water to spread out and slow down. You can also see the wetlands are growing in size because as this, uh, as more water is coming out of those stormwater outfalls, we want to again spread that out and and filter that water and let it slowly trickle back into uh, into the stream. The next storm event is a two-year storm event, and so this is a much bigger seasonal storm. And what you can see here is that the some of the um, the wetlands are completely full here and here and even over here and most of the stream is still contained within that active floodplain in some cases maybe it it goes over a little berm and 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 goes into uh, a constructed wetland here and this is all by design and what we want to do is make sure that we're giving as much space as possible for this typical seasonal storm but at the same time we want to preserve as much circulation as possible so you can see there's some circulation that's still accessible you know coming across even these low boardwalks allow you to cross the stream and get to the Park Peninsula and beyond. And it's not until the 100 year storm event, which is a real major storm event, you know, about five and a half inches of rain in a 24 hour period. So that's quite a large storm event. This is really the, the instance which, um, you know, even though it's called a 100 year storm event, it happens more frequently than every 100 years. We want to make sure that we're still providing access across the site with our higher bridges, both at the um, old former dam location here and from Attleboro Road into the Park Peninsula. Those will be high and allow the 100 year storm to pass underneath. As part of that whole understanding of hydrology, we then have been tasked with identifying how we um, locate all of these great park amenities that we've discussed in our engagement uh, process to date. Just as a reminder, you know, this is uh, a summary of all the things that we've talked about together. Some of these were our ideas, some of these were your ideas that you brought to the table. Uh, and these are, this is the palette of ideas that we've been working with behind the scenes here for the past couple months. What we did with that is we organized uh, a public engagement activity at our last open house uh, back in December. And what we asked participants to do was help us design the park and, and the park amenities that are most appropriate to be incorporated into the park. And if you participated in that, you'll understand what we're talking about here. But for those of you who didn't, we had a whole series of stencils of park amenities that are, were appropriately sized. And we asked participants to help locate those with a series of rules that they had to follow where those park amenities would go on the site and why. And we took all of that data that um, and all of the, the park designs that you helped us design and we brought that back with us and we created this list of prioritized park amenities. These are the things that you thought were most important and most appropriate to be designed into the park. And so we had a total of 46 um, completed park designs that were done by you and your neighbors. And we took all of that information and here you can see how many times those park amenities were used on your park designs and the percentage of which they showed up on those park designs. And we use this as a prioritized list for us to figure out, okay, we know what you think is most important and where you think generally it ought to go. So we're gonna use our professional judgment about how we strategically design that into the park and all of that engineering work that I just presented to you. And so here's a plan of just highlighting all of those amenities. And I won't walk you through this in detail because Glenn is gonna talk through this uh, in just a moment. But what you can see here is we tried to uh, distribute the park amenities as broadly as we can across the entire 60 acre study area. And we wanna make sure that all of these uh, amenities are accessible no matter which direction you're coming from to visit the park. So whether you're coming from Lee Road or you're coming from Shelburne or uh, South Park Boulevard or Attleboro, you're always gonna be engaged by the park amenities that we've dreamed up together. 
And again, just as a quick reminder, some of those amenities that we've talked about in previous previous engagement sessions, I'll just point those out for you. We have an outdoor classroom here, which we've highlighted uh, near the Beaumont School, which we think is just a natural uh, strategic decision so that that outdoor classroom can can get programmed by, um, by the students and, and staff. And here's some photos of what that might look like. And this is on one of those promontories that exist. Um, those natural promontories that was carved by the stream hundreds of years ago. There's also a sensory garden, which we've located near the old stilling pool. We'll point that out again on the illustrative plan, but we want to take advantage of that historic stonework that creates this really interesting space that we can reimagine as part of a sensory garden experience. And then lastly, the nature play area, which we'll, Glenn will talk a little bit more about as well, where we really want to get uh, families and, and kids especially out to really start to understand how an urban uh, stream works and, and, and learn about it in, in active ways in the park. And then in terms of circulation, there's a series of park amenities that help with circulation and, and really help uh, give you great vistas across the, the park. And we've strategically located the canopy walk and the pedestrian bridge at Attleboro Road and the Brook Overlook here at the high point of the site near uh, where Shelburne and North Park Boulevard intersect. And these not only are, are, we're trying to keep these as light of a touch as possible, but we're also trying to give you the best possible views across the site. And so you'll see some of that uh, as Glenn walks you through the details of the plan. And then lastly, I'll just note that we have had a, a pretty robust engagement process as part of this pre-design phase. And this is not the conclusion of that engagement. It's really just the, um, the end of the pre-design phase and the beginning of the detailed design phase. And so uh, we will roll out another engagement process that's very similar to this as a, the next cycle of engagement. But we've been really thrilled with your participation in this design process to date, and we really hope it continues. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Glenn to zoom into the illustrative plan and, and talk about some more of the details that we've designed into the park. Thanks, Matt. Um, hopefully that gives you a good sense of the, the overall systems that work in the park. And now uh, we're going to look at them in how they fit together in the completed preliminary park plan. Uh, we've sh we've shown this as these two rectangles, the the west and the east side of the park. That's for a couple of reasons. One, we're going to zoom into each park uh, section in a minute just to show more detail, but also because we know they have distinctive different characters. We've heard loud and clear throughout the process that you really want a park that is a nature park that gives new experiences for engagement in the natural world. So we've we've thought about that in a lot of different ways and. Primarily, the western half, where you have the largest trees and the largest forest stands, we've used as light a touch as we can. And the eastern half, where we had to do um, more interventions to create the restored stream corridors, that's where we put more of the programmed um, amenities and outdoor spaces in the park. So we're gonna we're gonna start by looking at the western half of the park and some of the amenities there. So as I mentioned, this is this is the more passive part of the park, the, the side of the park where we really want those existing magnificent trees to, and um, natural features to be the main attraction. So we've pr provided a lot of ways to engage and to experience and to walk through uh, the natural features of this half of the site. And I'm just going to run through them uh, one by one, starting in the uh, upper left here. One of the most popular features or elements, amenities that we had in our exercise was this canopy walk. And you can see this long bow shaped kind of uh, brown boardwalk here. That's up in the trees. That's about uh, 17 feet up in the trees. And that's located in this area because there are the largest trees on the site in this area. And the way the topography falls, it gives you the opportunity to gradually ascend into those trees as the land falls away. So you get the opportunity to experience understory trees and midstory trees and canopy trees as you walk along this boardwalk, even as it stays pretty much at a level elevation grade and uh, the ground falls away beneath you in the stream valley. 
Directly adjacent to that is the outdoor classroom with which Matt mentioned uh, that we've located near the Beaumont School. It's, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is its association with this canopy walk. We think the trees are one of the strongest teaching tools we have in this park. So having this outdoor classroom located near these trees and this potential access to them through the canopy walk is uh, just made a lot of sense to us. And also this promontory here or this, this land sticking out into the stream valley creates a gentle kind of descending ramp down into uh, the stream valley. So it creates easy accessible pathway for students and visitors, anyone to get down into the stream valley at this particular point. Um, the shared use path that we've been talking about as the way for bikes and for pedestrians to use the and get access to the stream valley uses the former parkway crossing. This was uh, built almost a hundred years ago. And it was a kind of U-shaped roadway that used to go down into the Stream Valley and then up back on South Park Boulevard. And most of that's been washed away by floods and, and other activities in the past, but some of it still exists. So we really want to take advantage of that and highlight the, the history of that and the, the function of it as a new way to uh, get down into the Stream Corridor. Um, the stormwater wetlands are, as Matt mentioned in, in the, the diagram, the floodplain diagrams that run throughout. This is just an example of one of them. Um, and they're, they're threaded throughout the park. And then really we're gonna work to make each one of them have, have a very distinct planted environment, ecological environment and character so that each one is an, an interesting kind of destination in and of itself. You begin to see adjacent to this, these boulder crossings, these, they look a little like um, these kind of twigs going across the stream corridor. And those are places that are necessary there to create riffles in the restored stream where water is going to spill over those and create these kind of um, terrace pools that step down and, and just the, the normal course of a restored stream. But also it provides the opportunity for people to engage with the restored stream corridor itself. And we imagine these is kind of big enough boulders that, that people could get out and potentially walk across and have a different experience with the stream corridor itself. Um, the hillside seating areas is the next one on the list here. And it's, it's set into the hillside. It's very informal. You have these kind of curving seats. And from this vantage point, you're up near North Park Boulevard and you get these great views into the restored stream valley on the Western half of the site. And we imagine it also with, um, perhaps flowering trees that would allude to the historic art orchards that used to be in this area. Moving now to the south side of the uh, western half of the restored park, there's the raceway, which is a very major feature of the site, the former raceway that the water from the former dam would force along until it got to the mill location at the far western side of the, the site. And some of you walked this with us when we walked the site. In this plan, we'd like to restore that raceway as well as a pathway along the entire length, an accessible trail along the entire length, so that people can experience this historic feature and understand the function of why the historic dam used to be there and, and how Shaker industry really worked. And we're proposing a kind of overlook at the location that would suggest where the former mill was at the far western edge. Um, this walking path to Lee Road, Matt mentioned just along the south side, there's, there's a ridge line just off the edge of the boulevard. And we're imagining an accessible trail there just to complete this uh, loop of the existing walkways around the perimeter of the site. And moving a little further to the east, We've talked about an orchard that was one of the elements that you had in the park design activity that we did. This, this existing lawn area and open space along South Park Boulevard we thought was really the most appropriate place for an orchard. And it, it wouldn't be a fruiting orchard, it would be kind of a flowering orchard and, and work in concert with the, the Village Garden Club plantings just further to the east. And as Matt mentioned, there's also the location for a sensory garden. We're thinking of utilizing the historic masonry, forming the stilling pool that's at the, the lower part of the existing dam structure there as kind of something that could be planted as a rich garden and might have really interesting auditory or sound experiences for people going into that space and would work in conjunction with a, 
uh, clearing in the forest right next to it to give diverse kind of sensory experiences for, for people using that part of the park. Another major element that we heard uh, was very popular was a pollinator garden. And we thought about some pollinator gardens in several places around the park, but we really thought the major place to have one would be along the walkway that goes over the former dam. And so that your experience of walking across this gently curving landform would be of a continuous kind of linear garden uh, with seasonally flowering native plants and other pollinator plants to really attract all kinds of uh, birds and insects to this walk and make it a really rich kind of garden experience. And one other element here is the um, hillside seating just to the right of that. There was a hillside amphitheater as one of the major elements of, um, of this design. And, and this, is, um, this is a first iteration of this. We'll get into that in just a second on the east side. We have the, the next one, Matt, yeah. So here's the east side of the park. And as I mentioned, this has more programmed, a little bit uh, less passive and more engaging kind of elements in it. And again, we'll start at the top here. Uh, the major element here, one of the, the most major elements is the new bridge. As, as Matt mentioned, we're gonna be removing part of the uh, impoundment structure, the former dam, and really creating a wide corridor for the, for the restored stream to go through there. And there'll be a new uh, bridge across this. And from that bridge, you'll get uh, great vistas to the west and to the east. It's about, uh, we'll be dropping the whole stream corridor along here to make it a, gen a gentle continuous pitch along the entire length. And it'll be about a 17 foot drop from that bridge down to the restored corridor. Um, if you move further to the east, you see more of these boulder crossings. And those boulder crossings would tie into a um, uh, nature play area that we're proposing at the foot of the slope from Horseshoe Lake Park. We really want that to be an engaging and kind of di dynamic space for kids to come and learn about uh, wetlands and native ecology and really have a series of different kind of uh, places where kids can explore through boardwalks and stepping stones and use, utilize the hillside above it too, which leads up to the former beach or uh, masonry structure called the beach. So that whole area we're envisioning kind of as the nature play zone. Moving further to the east, closer to Shelburne, you have the Brook Overlook, this kind of crescent-shaped boardwalk, and that's placed there because this is the highest point in the entire park. And from there, you'll get nice, beautiful, long views to the west along this whole restored stream corridor um, running along the north, north branch of the restored Dome Brook. And this is, we've labeled here a Shelburne Gateway. We, we've envisioned really a community gateway, both on the north side at Shelburne and on the south at Attleboro. And, and they may take the form of signage or pillars or, or walls, something to really signal and celebrate the, um, this arrival to the park and its connection to the adjacent community. Now let's look at the south side of, of this map, starting with the hillside seating area. So the hillside seating area, this was the Woodland Amphitheater from our exercise, and it's kind of transformed here a little bit into a little more broad and gentle kind of informal seating area, which would give great views over these new wetlands and the new confluence area of the two streams. So you could see them and experience them in all seasons as they change with um, over time and as the water and different storm events make these wetlands change as well. And there's an observation deck down in this wetland. And we've located a couple of these bird lines and, and observation decks. There was something that were very popular in the exercise as well. The hillside meadow is this yellow kind of area, the serpentine kind of strip of, of land. It represents this sloping hillside running all the way along the south side of the park and along the good, good portion of the northern part of the park too. And it will provide habitat for uh, songbirds and other pollinators and really help to tie the ecology and the uh, identity, the planted identity of the park together. Uh, it runs along the edge of these overlooks or park promontories, which Matt talked to you about when we talked about how we're gonna utilize sediment from the site. 
and um, the stormwater wetlands running along here, you can see they, they each have different sizes and different characters. You start to get an idea what they might feel like with some of the trees and shrubs and, and plantings just from the, the texture of these, uh, these plans and diagrams. The last feature here is this, um, this new bridge from Attleboro, which we envision as a very light kind of suspension bridge connecting at the high level over to the park directly from South Park Boulevard. Next one. And now we get into plant communities briefly. Uh, we're gonna keep developing our planting palette in the next phase of design, of course. I'll just mention a couple of the, the planted areas that we're thinking about. Um, you have the upland forests, which are going to be cleared of invasives. And then the, um, the lawn and tree areas, they're mostly the existing lawn and tree areas. We're reducing them quite a bit along the South Park Boulevard by introducing more meadow. And then uh, the hillside meadow, this kind of bright area here is what we've been mentioning. You can just see it clearly in this diagram, how that's going to be a strong ecological element. And then plant collection, starting um, with the Village Garden Club on, on South Park, we really envision a whole series of other kind of gardens, if you will, throughout the park on each one of these overlooks or promontories. We can imagine Gro just groves of distinct native trees, such as white oaks or, or hickories or walnuts, that would be uh, kind of a mini arboretum celebrating native trees. And the pollinator garden falls into that same kind of category running along the former dam. And these two orchards, one on the north and the south, also fall into that category. Um, let's move on to the, yeah. So um, the plant communities, you can see here, this diagrammatic section shows you how strongly these different ecological zones and planted characters relate to the topography of the, um, of, of the landscape. And you can, you can see the promontories and the upland forests up on top of the hillside and then the hillside meadow as it runs down to a path which is typically would run al along the edge on the inside crescent of these constructed wetlands. And then plant communities themselves within the constructed wetlands would be subtly terraced and different plants types would be planted in these areas to, to correlate to the different amount of inundation, how frequently they're gonna be underwater in each one of these constructed wetlands. And then this is the berm, this would represent the multi-use trail through the middle of the park and then stepping down into the, the active floodplain itself. And here's some of the images of those plant communities, just to give you a little bit sense, a little bit um, more visual sense of what they might look like. The upper left one is a, a typical idea of that kind of interactive wetland we're imagining in that nature play zone. The one in the middle uh, upper is a hillside orchard. And then on the right-hand side, the idea of one of those oak groves on those overlooks or promontories. In the lower left, you have the restored stream corridor, typical kind of vegetation you might see there. And the lower middle, you have the hillside meadow with um, kind of pathways just carved through it or mown through it. And then on the far right, the idea of what one of these constructed wetlands might look like that would be dedicated to a particular species. We might have one wetland dedicated to uh, blueberry hybrid, one dedicated to buttonbush, or one dedicated to just alders, where that would be the dominant plant and give it its very distinct planted character. Next one. And here's our first perspective. You, you saw a glimpse of this when we first opened the show. This is an aerial perspective uh, from the West looking back towards Horseshoe Lake Park itself. And there's a little key plan in the upper right-hand corner. This little red arrow here represents, it, you'd be standing at that dot and that V-shaped two arrows, it's a view that you're getting in this perspective. You're, you're up high, it's an aerial perspective, so it's part of the park at once. But I'll just talk you through some of the things that you see here so you can start to get a vision of what, what uh, the, the final park might look like. On the left-hand side, you see the restored stream corridor, the restored Dome Brook itself, running, meandering its way through the park and under the bridge, the new bridge that's going to connect um, across the former dam location, across this opening where the restored stream corridor is gonna run through the site. 
Those red columns are there just to help you see where this bridge is because we're showing such a large amount of landscape. But you see how you, you're going to get great views to the, to the east and to the west when you're on this bridge. It's really going to be a, a great experience. In the stream corridor itself, you start to see some of those, those boulder crossings that I mentioned previously, which create these riffles and noise and create uh, the opportunity for people to cross and get access to the stream corridor itself. And running right through the middle of this site, you see an image of that multi-use path. And you can see it, it's generous. It's designed really for people and bikes to have enough room to go through here safely and both enjoy the space, as well as um, an occasional ma maintenance vehicle, which might have to get down into the park to restore all these wetlands and just get any equipment down there we might need. And on the right-hand side, you see a rendering of what that sensory garden might start to look like. We mentioned the historic masonry wrapping around and creating this enclosed space and joining with kind of a woodland glade or opening next to it. So you have these very different kind of experiences creating this sensory garden. And then you even get a glimpse of that hillside seating on the right-hand side, up and over this, this berm of the, the former dam location. You can see those seats set into the hillside and wrapping around this constructed wetland uh, right next to it, which is gonna change with each different kind of storm event that you have. And far off in the distance here, you see that yellow kind of stripe of um, the hillside. That's the edge of Horseshoe Lake Park. We envision being much more open and flowing down to the um, nature play area at the base of the hillside, which gets you down into the restored Dome Brook itself. Let's move on to the, the next one. Then. And here's our, our second perspective. And this one is, is looking west from the um, middle branch of uh, Dome Brook. And you can see the, um, the red dot again is where uh, we're imagining the view is taken from. This is the idea that you would be standing on that bridge coming from Attleboro, high up at the level of South Park Boulevard and this kind of airy suspension bridge, which would take you directly over into the park from um, South Park Boulevard and its connection at Attleboro. And you can see, again, this meandering multi-use path running through the restored stream valley. And you can see the, the Doan Brook running next to it at kind of a low flow time during a, a, a typical kind of um, storm event or a few days after. You can see there's some water in the um, the constructed wetland on the left-hand side of this image. And you can see that hillside meadow wrapping around, forming this kind of enclosed space and meandering along that entire edge of the park, um, creating that, that very distinct identity and a series of places where people can get out and get a view over the restored stream. You can see the, the grove of trees at the top. You can see under those trees, that's about a 15 foot drop from that or changing grade, gradual changing grade from that overlook spot down to the restored stream corridor itself. And again, you can see some of these boulder crossings which are typical throughout the restored stream corridor. And on the right-hand side, a smaller path, there's gonna be a series of smaller paths throughout, but that's running at the base of Horseshoe Lake Park itself. Now I'm gonna hand it back over to Matt with that um, tour through the park and, and talk a little bit more of some of the practical issues we're gonna have to deal with. Thank you, Glenn, and bear with us. We're just about done, but we wanna make sure to illustrate to you uh, some of the next steps that are gonna be happening. And so what you can see on the screen here is what we're calling the district scope. This is the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer Districts uh, area of the park that they are able to use their funding to to implement. And so what you can see included here is essentially the entire 100 year floodplain that we we showed you, but also this major shared use path that connects North Park Boulevard down across a low um, wetland boardwalk across the, the, the branch of Doan Brook, continuing on all the way back down to South Park Boulevard. That's gonna be critically important for park users and circulation, but as Glenn mentioned, it's also gonna be important for district maintenance of the floodplain and the maintenance from the cities of the park space. And so that's something that will be included in this first phase of work that the district is, is implementing. 
the other big piece of it, as you know by now, is the north-south connection across the old earthen embankment. That um, pathway will be restored with that new long bridge that Glenn pointed out to you in some of the perspective renderings. That will be part of this first phase of work as well. Um, the other thing that's going to be important for you to take a look at is these dashed lines. They're a little bit hard to see, but if you look closely, you can see all these dashed lines. That is future circulation that will be implemented uh, by the cities at some point in the future to create that circulation network that we presented to you. And so the cities and the district will continue to work hand in hand in identifying exactly who and how all of this work is, is getting coordinated. And that's all stuff that we're going to focus on when we move into this detailed design phase uh, in, in, in pretty short time. But you can see the total a area of district scope is about 27 or 28 acres. So it's nearly half of the total study area. And we really think it's a, an exciting first phase of work to, um, to think about uh, as, as a phase one. Now, many of you are probably asking, well, what is the next phase? And uh, that's something that um, we know that the district and the cities will really be discussing in great detail this summer so that when we kick off the detailed design phase in the fall, there will be a very clear next steps uh, on that front as well. The other important thing to note here from this phase one perspective or the district scope perspective is almost all of what's being uh, implemented as part of this first step will be managed and maintained by the sewer district. And so highlighted in green here, you can see the approximate district maintenance corridor. And again, if you overlaid this on top of the 100 year floodplain, it would match pretty closely because, uh, so one way to think about it is any areas of the park that will be inundated by major storm events are going to be maintained by the district in, in most capacities. Now, there's some edge conditions where um, there will be discussions between the cities and the district, but um, rest assured that almost 100% of what's being implemented as part of this first phase of work will be actively managed and maintained by the district. And so we, we land back here at the landscape integration plan, which we've walked you through now um, pretty quickly over the past hour. And I just want to make sure that um, I note that we're very hopeful that you'll agree with us that this vision that we've established is, is really something that's both visionary and grounded. And we hope that you agree that it's reflective of what your community interests and desires are. Uh, we want to make sure that it's also of a character that you think is appropriate for Northeast Ohio. And so we encourage you to come out uh, and, and join us at the Cleveland Heights Public Library on Thursday evening um, to tell us how we did and to continue to provide your feedback as we move from this pre-design planning phase into the detailed design phase. So we're really looking forward to uh, continuing the design process with you. We hope you stay engaged with us. And, and rest assured that the district and the cities of Shaker Heights and Cleveland Heights are going to continue to work together to realize this vision that we've imagined together. And so lastly, I'll just note one more time that there's a ton of great information from this pre-design process that's available on the district's website. All of our virtual meetings, including this one, which will be available uh, later this week, they're all available on the district website, as are the frequently asked questions. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jen Elting from the district to uh, moderate our question and answer period. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you for all of the district staffers who um, have been working diligently to help me answer, um, answer some of these questions. But there are a few things, there are a few common themes that I've noticed um, in the questions, some of which I've uh, private messaged on the askers, letting them know I would ask it live. Um, but there are quite a few questions about um, invasive species and our plans for managing um, invasive species. Um, um, one, of the, one of the specifics is um, cattails that may be um, in the area as well as some other questions um, pertaining to, um, 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 just as far as just overall invasive species management. So I don't know if that's maybe a question that's best, um, best for Julie um, or um, someone else from the design team of Julie is with us today. Yes, she is. Okay. 
Hi. Hi, Julie. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Yeah, the uh, the map that uh, Matt and Glenn showed of the invasive species, we did um, make an effort to map the invasive species within the park. We put together some cost estimates and um, we presented those to the district. So it's basically just going to be on timing and um, whether you know that happens prior to the project or as part of the project. Since this is a design project, it's going to be part have to be a decision on whether it's a separate part of the project or if it's rolled in as a design uh, or as a bid component on the on the construction. So that's beyond my ability to answer at that point. Well, I'll I'm going to add on. Okay, invasive species. There's a lot lots of invasive species in the park. And you know, within the stream corridors and on the perimeter. And one of the things we need to do is rid the park to the extent possible of invasive species and maintain the park long term to control invasive species as we go forward. There are still a few decisions that need to be made and discussions between the district and the community, particularly on the perimeter uh invasive species in this park and 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 we're going to need to make some decisions on how and when do we deal with those to protect the newly uh built stream corridors and wetlands the district already has an invasive species management contract that we utilize on other projects and we will utilize here and as we we get into the gray areas of, you know, what's a community maintenance responsibility for the district on the final park plan. There are ways of partnering, I think, between the communities and the districts to manage invasives. Our commitment is to manage them and our contracts in place to do so and we'll apply it here as well. Thank you, Frank. Um, there is a question um, in the Q&A, and this is probably a perfect question for Matt and, or even Glenn more specifically, but um, one of our attendees is concerned about accessibility to the stream and being able to get down and actually interact with the water. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about some of the, um, some of the um, elements that you're looking that would encourage um, that up close and personal um, experience with Downbrook. Sure, yeah, I could start, and Glenn, I'm sure you'll have something to add to that as well, but um, I, I think the most important thing to note is that most of the paths will be accessible it, within the park, and if, so if you squint at this plan as an example, any of the paths that are a little bit wider um, are, are certainly going to be accessible, and what that means for us is that the pathways are very gently sloped at or under 5%, where you'll be able to easily um, um, navigate vertically up and down into the stream corridor and back up to the boulevards in a very gentle way. Um, and one of the primary reasons for us uh, really working hard to make that happen is because we want to get as many people as possible to interact with the stream itself and, and make sure that you know, at the 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 centerpiece of this park is is the the north and middle branches of of Dome Brook, and we want to make sure that that's accessible to everyone. Uh, Glenn, guess, I'm sure you have. Yeah, go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, I, I guess I'll add to that. I'm I'm excited about the question because it's something we've been thinking about quite a bit, and um, you know, we're providing a number of ways for people to get up close and and personal with with Dome Brook and. Probably the most obvious one are these uh, boulder crossings, which we, we've put in two distinct locations here, but we imagine there'll be a lot more of them. But this one in particular that Matt is, is highlighting these kind of uh, fingers of uh, boulder crossings, we imagine people, uh, kids, more able people will take advantage of those and use them to actually get down to the level of the stream and cross from one path system to another in lower, you know, when the water's at a reasonable level. And we think that's going to be a great experience for uh, people who can use those. For people who can't use those, um, there's a, a number of other ways to get access to the water. But, but one of them is this nature play zone at the, the nose of Donebrook uh, at Horseshoe Lake Park itself. 
And we, the water's gonna come in from that, from Doan Brook during certain storm events. It's gonna come, be backwatered from the stream itself and fill up to different levels. But in this area here, we imagine accessible kind of curving boardwalks that would get you through at a very low level because the water here would be much more contained and controlled. So we imagine this is a place where um, people who have uh, access challenges could get access to the water and kids could get access to the water in a kind of very controlled and um, um, smaller kind of scale environment, but, but still in a space that's actively connected to Doan Brook itself. And then there's also a series of, of trails, which Matt mentioned are a little bit hard to see you have this kind of main pathway um, through the middle of the mixed use trail, which is gonna be wide and easily accessible, but there are all these smaller pathways. And, and one in particular, there's, yeah, there's these kind of small pathways around the outside of each one of these wetlands. And we imagine those really at the level of those wetlands. So walking along those, you'll be right at the level of the native plants that are gonna go back in there and the animals that are gonna be attracted. So those are also really uh, great engagement zones. That's where we're putting some of these, these overlook um, kind of structures and bird blinds along those paths. So those are a, another way to really get access to the water. Hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. If it does not answer your question, please feel free to just drop another one in there, and we'll keep we'll keep um, we'll keep asking more questions. Um, I have a question, probably for Julie, um, but someone is concerned about the wetlands that are here um, that are designed as part of the project. Um, if they will um, encourage mosquito breeding and mosquito um, mosquitoes in the area, we did touch on it a little bit in the in the Q and A piece of it, as far as um, the stream and the wetlands continually moving. But I thought maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about how, um, when you're redesigning the streams, you you ensure that we don't have um, mosquito populations. Yeah, that's always a common question. I'll encourage anybody else in the district or anyone else wants to join in, but um, it's going to be based on how um, those wetlands are designed and for how long they can hold water. Um, and if they're more of a, I say seasonally inundated feature where they're, you know, hanging around for say a month or more, or maybe even two months, um, because they are connected to some of those ponds are gonna be connected to stormwater outfalls that might have a little bit more of a continuous flow. If that's the case, um, you know, you generally get some populations of, of uh, you know, insects and some, um, amphibians and things like that that help target some of that mosquito population. But um, some of the, if that's a major concern, you know, that's also something we can look at the design of some of those features are, you know, if they're truly a stormwater component and as they, you know, stay hydrated for 24 to 48 hours, then they'll drain out. And so there's, then there's really not a concern for mosquito breeding in the population. So it's, it's variable, um, you know, but a lot of mosquitoes technically will, will breed very effectively in buckets and people's yards and 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 you know, like trash and debris that holds just only a small amount of water. Um, you know, the the pond that was the horseshoe lake that was there before probably bred mosquitoes as well. Um, but uh, you know, there was a fish population even you know even though they had goldfish, uh, were still eating some of those mosquitoes. But that's a good question. It's variable. It's something to consider in the design, and we appreciate the question. Yeah, Julie, I'll just add too to that, that, you know, one of the reasons that we showed those diagrams highlighting all the different storm events is because we really think all of these water features, whether they're stormwater gardens or the stream itself, are going to be very dynamic. You know, we've captured a static image here for the purposes of, you know, illustrating the park idea, but the reality is that the water levels in all of these will be constantly changing to environmental impacts. And so um, that's what we really think is exciting about it. And it's really this next detailed design phase where we start to put those inundation periods and durations and, you know, elevations of all of these things to, to the test to make sure we're designing them to, for the desired outcomes. Yeah, that's why we have those detailed hydraulic models. They're able to show those fluctuations in water level. So uh, we can get pretty nuanced into the analysis of how wet those wetlands stay. Thank you. And I have a question in here. Um, it just came through, but um, I so I could 
type it or I can just go ahead and I can ask it. This is probably a great question for Matt and Janet, um, but they want to know a little bit more about, um, about our maintenance work and what we do to assure um, that the project, the rest Stonebrook restoration will not be um, filled with litter, just as far as some of our routine maintenance um, that we do on, on our portions of these projects. Sure, I can go ahead and answer that. So um, we have a full maintenance crew here at the Regional Sewer District that is devoted to maintaining the regional stormwater system. So we go out and inspect our sites on a regular schedule. Um, we do look for litter, invasive plants, things like that. Also debris that might wash into the stream channel. Um, that can be natural debris that's causing issues like erosion or flooding. It can also be man-made debris that gets thrown into our creeks and rivers, such as, you know, anything from um, just basketballs to cars, to be honest. So <laughs> we find all kinds of things in our regional system. Um, we will be watching the wetlands, especially very carefully because those are stormwater outfalls. So, and through the design phase, we will be looking at ways to limit the amount of trash that does flow into those. So that's always one of the things is trying to figure out a way to um, reduce it at its source. So that's some of the stuff that we do on the maintenance side. Thank you, Janet. I hope that answers um, everyone's question. But Janet, while I have you, I think I'm going to keep you um, because there is another question about more about floodplains and how they work. Um, and the question specifically is why do the more severe storms that Matt and Glenn showed in the presentation, why do they flood um, so many acres within the park? And then it's specifically that if there's no dam, how does that happen? And how does the water get filled up if there's no dam like holding it in place is basically what the yeah. question is. That, that's a very good question. And it's something that, you know, in an urban system, um, sometimes we're not used to really seeing as much because to be completely honest, a lot of these streams have lost their floodplains. So a floodplain for a well-functioning stream is extremely important. And it's actually something that we want to see. So those diagrams that you saw, the images that you saw of the floodplain actually filling up, inundating that area, that's a well-functioning stream system. When it does that, it slows those flows down. So it lessens the amount of damage overall, both in that section of the stream as well as downstream because it's holding back some of those flows in that section, in that upstream area. And if anyone else, I know we have a lot of stream experts on here. If anyone else would like to elaborate on that, um, please feel free to. Well, Janet, I'm not a stream expert, but I will uh, weigh in here a little bit and, and just note that, you know, one of the things that uh, we talked about at the very beginning of this project is the importance of the stream in moving water and moving sediment. And uh, the goal or the, the purpose of streams is to do those two things primarily. And so removing the dam and removing the, the object that um, bec has become the barrier for that to happen is a big part of this project because we want to make sure that we're regulating certainly the flow of, of the water, but certainly allowing the, the, the sediment that uh, accumulates in the stream from the upstream watershed to continue pushing itself out to Lake Erie, which is uh, one of the most important th things of, of stream function as we've learned from, from Julie and others. for the hang up there. I was answering a question while y'all were talking, so I apologize about that. There are a lot of questions we're going to continue to keep trying to get to as many as we can. Um, this is possibly um, a question for, um, for Matt or Glenn, um, but there are some questions in here. There's a few of them about um, what the plans are for um, the masonry that's there at, on site right now. So the, the older spillway, as well as um, the, the stone area that's by the, um, the, the beach space as well. I think that's what it was called. Sure. Yeah, we can, um, I can start with that and Glenn, feel free to chime in, but there's a couple sure. of spaces that are, um, have uh, masonry that's historic in one degree or another. And I'll just point some of those out here on the plan. The one is the stilling pool here on the low side of the old earth and of the old dam. Um, there's the masonry around the um, apex of the 
um, the park peninsula where the old wading pool used to be, splash pad. And then there's the area of the beach um, that was uh, that Jen mentioned right here. And and those three areas um, were all constructed, well, not all, but you know, some of them were constructed in different eras and some of them were constructed above or behind or above or in front of older masonry in the case of the stilling pool. And so while we can't say with certainty, in fact, we're, we're pretty sure that none of that masonry is, uh, that's visible today is from the Shaker area. It is historic in one way or another, and we wanna make sure that we're being sensitive to that. With regards to what the plan for it is, um, that's largely gonna be a conversation that we bring into the detailed design phase about the structural integrity of all of those things and the cost to repair them, which we don't know the answer to either of those two things quite yet. Um, but our intention, and Glenn, you could probably speak to this as well, is that we want to make sure that we're preserving this masonry in some way because we know it has historic value and, and meaning for you. Uh, and so we're going to do all the work that we need to do to answer some of those questions about um, how much work we need to do to make it structurally sound and how much it will cost um, to, to do that work. I, th I think another aspect of that question, if I'm understanding it correctly, is, you know, when we do remove sections of the um, existing dam, there is masonry that's going to come down and how we're going to reutilize that in the plan. And, and two of the areas we're thinking of are this these hillside seating areas, which we imagine would be built out of stone. And we would definitely imagine incorporating the historic masonry into that kind of structure, both on this kind of outdoor seating on the south side um, and on the north side, uh, both adjacent to the new bridge location. We've also envisioned these kind of hillside scrambles, we like to call them, and, and one of them is um, along the hillside below the beach, the idea that you'd use some of those as kind of stepping stones that um, kids and, and anyone really could use to um, explore and meander their way up and down that hillside to get down to that nature area as, as an alternative pathway. So we, we've thought about ways to utilize them in places that are adjacent to uh, preserved historic masonry that Matt was just mentioning a, more, uh, a moment ago, but uh, we think we understand it's very important to keep them on site and make sure people are aware where they came from. And Glenn, one more thing I just thought of is that the when the emergency breach was cut into the dam uh, a couple of years ago, there was some historic masonry that was removed as part of that process that has all been palletized and set aside for our use in the redesign of the park. So. Um, we'll certainly be integrating that in ways that Glenn mentioned, in addition to any sort of other masonry that's impacted by um, this proposed plan. Thank you. And I think there's just about two more questions. Um, the next one is probably for um, Julie or Frank Greenland. Um, and it's more of a statement in here, but I think um, it comes up pretty, pretty regularly. So I think for those of us who are um, new to um, our public meetings, I think it would be worth um, worth addressing for some of our attendees. Um, but it's a comment about migratory birds and that um, someone is concerned that um, that the birds that were attracted to the Horseshoe Lake will not be attracted to this area and what is going to happen um, to those birds that historically came to the site. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the general gist of it. I will take the first crack at this answer. And we've, we've, we've had this question before. It is my opinion that changes in habitat will create and can create changes in diversity. Uh, and in the birding community, there is no question. I will say this, you know, a lake can attract certain duck species. And I've talked about this before, the diving ducks, they require deep water. There are other types of ducks that do not. So species such as wood ducks, green wing teal, blue wing teal, all migratory birds are quite attracted to wetland features. Uh, and other bird species are as well. You know, it's interesting because I, have heard that the diversity of birds will go away with a wetland feature. And I couldn't disagree with that more, to be honest with you. Now we have received numerous, several uh, emails recently and in the past, I received one recently from a resident that comes to Horseshoe Lake 
and actually has pleaded with us <laughs> to create a good wetland habitat. They are seeing different birds, different species for longer periods of time than they ever have. So shorebirds, rails, egrets, other species that won't inhabit a lake, but will inhabit a wetland feature. So the bird world changes. I think the classic example of this would be Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. Doan Brooks, what I would say is Doan Brooks premier birding spot at Lake Erie. That used to be a mud flat for contaminated sediments from the Cuyahoga River. And then it reverted, okay? Trees, shrubs, small growth, and the diversity of birds changed throughout that process. It was the best shorebird habitat in Northeast Ohio for a while. And then as that area has grown up today, it is one of the premier warbler and migratory bird traps in Northeast Ohio. So birds adapt. The loss of a lake doesn't mean the loss of diversity. It means changes in diversity. I think can bring good things. So certainly there will be some that might be displaced, but they will be replaced by others that prefer this type of habitat. And our goal is to create a diverse habitat to attract a diverse you know, population of birds and other, other um, ecological features. So I don't think it's, you know, all is not lost. I think there's a lot of gain to be made here. Thank you, Frank. And I think I just have two more questions. I'm waiting for clarification from one of my attendees um, on this, but um, there are some questions about how this specific project will impact um, Lower Lake and the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes. Um, I did speak to one of the um, Shaker or the Nature Center questions um, in the Q&A, but if we could maybe just touch on those and how the whole system works, works together. I'll take it, but Janet, I'd like you to weigh in. So how does the whole system work together? You know, we're highly cognizant of the, of the nature center and cognizant of you know, mitigating impacts to the nature center. So things like flow, sediment, other things are on our radar and our engineering and design needs to account to minimize sediment transport, deal with flow issues, and we're confident that we will do so. Then the flows go to Lower Lake. We are going to restore the Lower Lake Dam, replace the Lower Lake Dam. And again, we have to be cognizant of flows arriving from this area to Lower Lake and then do the right things at the Lower Lake Dam to restore that dam to meet today's standards for dam safety. And that project is just about to launch. We've selected a consultant for pre-design and we will move forward and there will be plenty of public discussion regarding that project. So all of these things are interrelated and there have been discussions with the Nature Center as well. And there will continue to be discussions with the Nature Center so that we all understand the changing dynamics in the system. I don't know if you have anything to add, Janet. Yeah, I'll just add that um, we didn't cover it in this presentation, um, but we have covered it in the previous ones, how the whole system, works together. And one of the main things to understand is that Horseshoe Lake is very high up in the watershed, whereas Lower Lake is much further down and it's at um, a confluence of the major branches of Dome Brook. So it's, it plays more of a point of control. And that's why the sewer district will be working to replace or reconstruct the Lower Lake Dam. Um, but it's a little bit, it, it's, um, quite a bit to get into at this point in the presentation, but I do know that we did discuss it in the previous ones. And if you want to um, further discuss it, please email us at askus at neorsd.org, or I will also be at the um, meeting on Thursday at the library. And I have the last one because there's still a few questions, but um, as Janet mentioned, we will be at the library to address those. You can also ask them to ask us at neorsd.org, but um, there are some questions that are in here. Um, 
related to costs. And that's something that we will definitely get into, um, into the design, um, design portion of this project. Um, but the last question that I have is, um, is that it deals with, um, it says that the new path of the stream, so the new stream alignment will be higher as an altitude wise um, than the old one at the east end, like just where the upper confluence hits. So how do, what do you do when you're designing this project to keep the new stream out of its old path? So how do you keep it from reverting to, to its old path? Um, and I did ask for clarification and the questioner said um, it was a higher as an altitude, not more north. So since it's physically at a higher level, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can take that one. This is Julie from Enviroscience. Um, it's a good question, good thought. Not a, not a lot of people would think that. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of concern about it reverting to its old path. One, we're taking it pretty far north uh, in distance, but just from a standpoint of elevation or altitude with it being lower. And if you remember, that was one of the areas we were going to fill the existing channel uh, with um, material likely going to be spoiled from excavation of the new stream. And so that is going to be filled up. So also, um, you know, it would require a significant um, change in the downstream condition for that to kind of head cut back through that, that reach through there. Uh, and also the fact that, you know, there's going to be a dam essentially blocking the existing path of the, the old stream. Uh, and the new opening through the dam where the majority, you know, basically all the hydrology is going to go into that new channel. Um, if we saw a massive load of sediment, you know, like we um, didn't responsibly manage the sediment when it came down and aggraded the new stream channel, which would, would it's very rare that that would happen. Um, but that would be a situation where the stream would maybe try to find its way through the, through the forest and maybe hit one of these low points. But we're, we're thinking about those things. I think we've got a good plan to avoid that happening. And uh, I've designed a lot of streams and, uh, and that's generally not a concern if you plan appropriately. Thank you, Julie. And just one more quick one. Um, will the wetland areas sometimes be dry when there are drought conditions? Yeah, I can answer that one too. So yeah. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the drainage area for this is, you know, at the, at Lee Road culverts, 1.91 square miles, it's like uh, 1200 acres, you know, and each one of those branches is less than that. So the north branch is just, you know, just over a square mile and the middle branch is about 0.66 square miles. Tr traditionally in Northeast Ohio, anything, you know, close to a square miles or perennial stream. Um, but, you know, as we get into drier periods, um, yeah, those, those stream will get down to a, a kind of a low flow. The wetlands will tend to dry up seasonally, like July, August, even into September will likely be dry. That's when the plants really begin to grow and take off. Uh, and you get a lot of plant diversity happening in those wetlands. But yes, um, there's, it's quite potential that those are not going to be wet uh, throughout the entire season. Unless they're designed that way. Again, you know, we had questions about mosquitoes. We also have questions about waterfowl and attracting different types of birds. So it's going to be a give or take. And it's also going to be dependent on those stormwater sources. You know, like if you get a summertime storm, that's going to come in and inundate some of those wetland features. I just want to say one more comment about those wetland features. If any of folks had seen some of the earlier design iterations, a lot of those wetlands were just like kind of blue ovals. And what I like is that, you know, Stimson and the team, we really took this kind of habitat complexity it was one of the things we evaluated in our concepts. And if you can see that the schematics on those wetlands have a lot of undulations and figures uh, and fingers in them. So what we call heterogeneity or, you know, um, that adds to that diversity and complexity of those areas uh, to really increase the biodiversity, not only the plants, but the species that are visiting those sites. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, a lot of these things that we will continue to have discussions um, as we move into the design phase. So I know a lot of your questions about, about cost and different plant species, things like that. That's all something that we will continue to, to work through, to work with the communities on as we go through um, the design phase. But I encourage all of you to please come to um, our, um, our open house for the Donebrook Restoration near Horseshoe Lake Park project. We will be at the Cleveland Heights Public Library on Lee Road. 
um, in three days from now, so this Thursday from 5.30 until 7.30, um, we will have a lot of posters with a lot of the renderings and the drawings that, that Glenn and Matt shared with you today. And the whole team will be there to, to answer questions and, and continue to have conversations. So I appreciate um, the more than what 1600 responses that we got to, for our public engagement process throughout this entire pre design phase. Um, it was so exciting to be part of this project and see this sheer number of people that came out and spent hours with us, you know, drawing and planning and, and all of this stuff. Um, so we will continue to do a lot of that public engagement through the design phase. Um, for those of you with questions about the Lower Lake project, we will be doing some public engagement around that as well, um, beginning um, later this summer, and then probably have our first meetings um, into the fall for those of you who are interested in the Lower Lake project as well. Um, and again, for those of you who may be um, watching this recorded or you didn't get a chance to think about your question until sometime later tonight or tomorrow, by all means, please send us an email to ask us that's A-S-K-U-S -S at N-E-O-R-S-D dot org. You can also contact our customer service department with questions about this project. They will route them to the appropriate person, as well as information about our various cost savings programs. Um, our customer service department can be reached at 216-881-8247. Again, that's 216 881 8247 or ask us at NEORSD. So thank you very much and I hope to see you all on Thursday. Have a great night. Thanks everybody.